By now, you've probably heard that astronomers have discovered a gas called phosphine in the upper atmosphere of Venus, our closest planetary neighbor. And you've probably heard a bunch of clickbait takes on how this could mean there's life on Venus, and what that all means, and all that. But like, what even is phosphine, and how can it indicate there's life in one of the most hellish and inhospitable places in our solar system? Today, let's look past the hype and talk about the biochemistry of how life on Earth makes phosphine, what exact kind of life could use phosphine to survive in the acid-soaked clouds of the upper Venusian atmosphere, and why discovering this gas is such a huge breakthrough. So yeah, hi. This YouTube channel is usually devoted to unpacking the ludicrous complexity of biochemistry here on Earth, but I'm trying out this current events format to jump on this trend as quickly as I can. If you want to understand the tiny molecular machines that power your life and all life on Earth, hit that subscribe button and please consider donating to my Patreon. But anyway, to recap this discovery, a paper came out in Nature last week detailing how scientists have used some really good astronomy to basically confirm the presence of phosphine gas on Venus, that is pH. PH3 gas. I'm not going to talk about the cool science they used to confirm the presence of PH3, that's not my job today. Now, if you know anything about our solar system, you know that Venus is basically hell. So talking about life on Venus is a pretty incredible 180 from the established science. We're not talking about life on the surface of Venus, though. All the surface is good for is melting lead and crushing Soviet landers. However, way above the surface, in the upper clouds, things calm down a bit on Venus. The pressure up here is similar to the surface of Earth, and the temperature is way more temperate and tolerable. So much so that there's a literal NASA proposal for a Venus mission where instead of sending a lander, we would send a straight-up zeppelin with people on it to hang out in these clouds and do science and stuff. Forget a moon base, I'm way more into the idea of space blimps. But we should also note that these clouds are largely made out of sulfuric acid, which would make it pretty hard for life as we currently understand it to survive up here. But now this phosphine discovery is forcing us to change our understanding. Maybe. The gist here is that phosphine is pretty fragile as a gas, and since Venus is closer to the Sun than Earth, it's exposed more to UV radiation than we are, so whatever pH 3 gets made should get destroyed pretty quickly. However, something is making a lot more phosphine than there should be, way more than, say, an abiotic level. If the situation were reversed, if Venusian scientists were looking here on Earth, you could potentially say the same thing about oxygen or even methane in Earth's atmosphere. There's way more O2 in our atmosphere than there should be, so there must be something making that oxygen. In this case, that's photosystem 2 in every plant and cyanobacteria cell here on Earth. But what kind of biological process makes phosphine? And here's the annoying part. We actually haven't precisely defined the biochemical pathways that make phosphine. Don't get me wrong, scientists have pretty much proven beyond a reasonable doubt that a lot of phosphine on Earth is produced by life. Phosphine is produced in fun places like swamp soils, sewers, and decaying corpses. This means that, probably, phosphine is produced by certain bacteria who use it as a part of their metabolism. It's just that the scientific community hasn't taken a lot of time to really nail down the organism's enzymes and proteins that utilize pH 3 in this way. Which kind of makes sense. I mean, how much do you want to be the swamp gas scientist? It's cool figuring out how leaves and animals make energy. It's not as cool as digging around in a bog until you have a few extremely specific species of bacteria that you can study and then have to keep alive outside of anaerobic conditions. It's really hard to study these bacteria, so it's understandable that we haven't nailed these pathways yet. But we do have enough papers that give us a pretty good guess as to how and why life makes phosphine. Let's look at a few and then we can talk about how Venusian microbes might be making this gas. The first theory comes from corpses. Neat! Medical scientists have found phosphine gas in dead bodies, the moment where a body's cells completely break down and bacteria really start chomping on all the cellular bits that once made it alive. Phosphine might be a byproduct of some bacteria eating the phosphate ions in the DNA of these cells. Now I can already hear you pushing back on this point. If this kind of phosphine metabolism was how life on Venus gets its energy, that would mean there's an even larger Venusian biosphere that we haven't discovered. This pH 3 discovery is already paradigm-breaking enough. There's no way this phosphine is being made by the breakdown of even bigger floating organisms, right? This is why we need to look at the ancient Earth to figure out what kind of life might be currently hanging out on Venus. Before cyanobacteria and plants filled our atmosphere with oxygen, life on Earth was largely anaerobic. It didn't use oxygen to breathe. Furthermore, a lot of these organisms were chemolithotrophs. Chemo, that means chemical, litho, meaning rock, and troph, meaning eat. 
Before plants, life on Earth was mostly chewing rocks around volcanic vents, getting energy that way. There are a lot of well-examined pathways for chemolithotropes. You've got methanogens, an ancient archaea that hang out in the same swamps where pH 3 gets made on Earth, air quotes eating hydrogen and air quotes breathing carbon dioxide, producing methane as a byproduct. You've also got Animox bacteria, which take in ammonium and breathe nitrite. And then you've got sulfate-reducing bacteria and archaea. They eat hydrogen and breathe the sulfate ion. Again, with all of these, I am glossing over a few dozen PhDs worth of steps, but there are a lot of living things on Earth which eat and live this way. So it's not much of a stretch to think that maybe some kind of microorganism can figure out how to take in phosphate and produce phosphine as a byproduct in the extremely acidic cloud droplets of Venus. Especially when you consider that most of these chemolithotropes on Earth live in extremely hot or acidic environments already, like around volcanic vets or deep in swamps and wherever. This is looking like a solid explanation as to what could be happening with microorganisms making pH 3 in Venus's clouds. But then we get to a big ol' however here, and realize that some researchers have shown that eating phosphate and making phosphine is something called an endergonic process. It uses energy. That is not at all useful for a living thing. Metabolism needs to release stored energy so that living things can turn it into ATP or some other useful molecules to actually go about the business of eating, breathing, and being alive. And so that realization takes us to the next theory. You know what else is an endergonic process? The first half of photosynthesis. Plants use the energy of sunlight to blow up water molecules, harvesting their electrons and protons. That part of the process takes so much energy, which plants get from sunlight, but plants can only access that energy once it's been used to turn carbon dioxide into glucose. So the detection of phosphine may be helping us only see part of the story of how living things can survive and thrive in an environment as wild as the acidic clouds of another planet. But that honestly makes way more questions than it answers. Like, I'm not trying to prove the existence of some weird phosphorus-based version of photosynthesis, though. So maybe it's more like nitrogen fixation here on Earth, where certain bacteria expend insane amounts of energy breaking N2 gas in the atmosphere in order to turn it into ammonia and therefore use that ammonia to make DNA, amino acids, and a whole mess of other incredibly important molecules. Yes, nitrogen fixation is insanely endergonic. Some of these bacteria are throwing 16 ATP molecules at a single molecule of nitrogen gas just to make it useful. But the uses you get from turning nitrogen into ammonia are everything for life, to the point that most of us rely entirely on these nitrogen fixating bacteria to, you know, make our own proteins and actually make our food useful. It's the, one of the most important chemical processes on Earth. And so maybe phosphine is produced as a byproduct of a similar process. I honestly like this theory the best because if you look at where nitrogen and phosphorus are on the periodic table, you see that ammonia and phosphine are kind of like molecular cousins. Maybe we're dealing with a kind of life that has phosphorus atoms where nitrogens would be on Earth, and the excess phosphine gets spewed out into the atmosphere. But why bother with all this conjecture anyway? Why are we so sure it's even life that's doing this? Because, in this paper, a team of scientists worked very hard determining how fast non-living and geological processes could produce this phosphine gas, and the levels of phosphine are simply being produced too quickly for anything but life to be considered, at least right now. Now, we could come back to this a year from now, and a really smart team of atmospheric scientists could have come up with a brilliant, complex theory for how the Venusian atmosphere produces this gas without life, or, on the other side, a brilliant team of biochemists could finally double down with a bunch of swamp gas and determine the exact way phosphine is produced here on Earth, giving astronomers another gas to look for. Maybe there's another indicator as a part of phosphine metabolism that we can search for using spectroscopy. Giving astronomers another gas to scan for. Either way, right now, it's really exciting to consider that in the search for life beyond Earth, we've been looking in the wrong direction. Maybe our closest neighbor still has some life clinging to its upper atmosphere. The best way to find out is to simply go there and bring back samples of these clouds to study. Forget moon bases and Mars landings, let's get space blimps back on the table and send people to the upper atmosphere of Venus. Hashtag space blimps, hashtag get it trending, hashtag I don't know how social media works, I'm not even going to try. But then, how cool space blimps are aside, what does that actually mean if we actually confirm there is life on Venus? What's the point of all of this research? Well, practically for you and me, there being life on Venus doesn't mean much more than me saying there's life in your kombucha. 
I mean, sure, that's cool, but as conscious beings, our real excitement will come from there being multicellular or intelligent life out there. Life that our lizard brains can actually interact with. This is why you have to game it out and think one step beyond, go beyond the clickbait and try to understand why we even want to find even the barest form of microbial life out there. If you game it out, confirming that there definitely is or definitely isn't life on Venus helps us so much in our quest to understand the universe. Because if we prove this phosphine on Venus is made by life, and we discover a completely different tree of life clinging to the few remaining watery pockets on Mars, that tells us that, you know, life, uh, finds a way, no matter what environment it is in. Sure, it might be harder to evolve complexity and intelligence, but if pretty much every single rock in our solar system has found a way to develop life, then it can be a lot saner to assume that a huge number of the thousands of planets we've discovered out there in the Milky Way have a similarly easy time massively raising the likelihood that we are not alone in the universe, and, and that maybe there is intelligent life much closer to us, and the universe is simply a dark forest where it's either impossible for us to communicate, or we simply should not communicate. And it's also important on the other side, because if despite all these findings there is not and never has been life on Venus or Mars or Europa or anywhere else in the solar system, that tells us how precious and rare these biochemical processes are, and how important it is for us to preserve and protect them here on Earth, giving us an incredible mandate to preserve the impossible miracle that is our consciousnesses by making sure our species has outposts on as many worlds as possible. Maybe we're the first to the party and it's our job to seed the galaxy with intelligent life. Either way, the magic of discoveries like this is that we get a better view into our place in the universe. The more we figure out where we are and what our neighborhood is like, the more we can figure out where to go. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you so much for getting to the very end of this video. If you want to see the sources I have for this video and get into corrections and make sure that I'm getting to the right answer here, please check out my Twitter, at this underscore clockwork, link down there in the description. I'm listing all of the papers I used to figure out phosphine chemistry, as well as the original paper that started all this. I also linked the webinar where the scientists who actually made this discovery explained it, and I really recommend you watch it. There is nothing better than the raw science. Get in those papers, read that data, come to your own conclusions, that's where the real magic is. At the same time, if you like videos like this, I really want to encourage you to donate to my Patreon. I'm getting much better at making these videos quickly and getting on top of trends, and I want to make sure that I can advance biochemistry as much as possible, and Patreon donations are the best way to make that happen. At the same time, while this video was a quick hit and I didn't have enough time to have a robust fact-checking process, I want to call out my principal fact-checker for most of my videos, Unshit Singh, who is also a founding member of the Biocord community over on Discord. Highly recommend you join this Discord channel. It is one of the best resources I have for making this channel. This channel would be awful without all of the amazing scientists, students, and people there to support me. Either way, thank you so much for getting to the end of this video here with me. I really appreciate going on this journey with you. And as always, I like to leave you with peace, love, and autotrophs. Everyone be well. Thank you so much.